In early 2015 in Yorkshire, the remains of a body were discovered in an unmarked grave. They belonged to a man who had died in his early 20s. Beside him lay a large sword and the heads of five spears. It was an Iron Age ritual burial. Graves like this have been discovered throughout Europe, and we now know that this man once shared a common culture that stretched from Turkey to Portugal. We know this because he was one of our prehistoric ancestors. A Celt. In Britain, we're never far from our Celtic past. The Celts seem to belong to a shadowy, wilder, more primal time than anything in more recent history. But much about their origins, beliefs, and ultimate fate remains a mystery. But a story etched in vivid color is how these powerful tribal people battled for survival against their arch enemy, the Roman Empire. From the first Celtic raiding parties that rampaged through ancient Italy to Julius Caesar's campaign in Gaul and the Celts' last stand under the warrior queen, Boudicca. One of the greatest cultural conflicts that still defines our world today and reveals Europe's most enigmatic ancient people. Rome, once the heart of Europe's greatest empire. For hundreds of years, this city ruled over lands stretching from Syria to Britain. Rome's power was forged on its military strength, enshrined in its laws, economy, and monuments. But even before this empire spread across Europe, it would be challenged by powerful barbarian forces from lands north of the Alps. Warrior tribes that would fire the imagination of Romans for centuries to come. The Celts. This is the Roman image of the Celt. It's called the Dying Gaul. He's completely naked. He has tousled and unkempt hair, a moustache, and around his neck, he's wearing a torque, which is the ultimate status symbol of the elite Celtic warrior. In Roman eyes, this is the quintessential naked savage. And more importantly, it's a naked savage who has been subdued and defeated. Here in his side, he's bleeding from a mortal wound and in his agonies, dropped his sword to the ground and then slumped alongside it, awaiting death. It's a beautiful and very powerful and moving work of art, but it's also propaganda. This is how Rome wanted its citizens to see, to perceive the Celtic opponent. As noble, yes, but essentially a savage, a powerful, potent image to set against the idea of Rome as a disciplined, ordered, civilizing presence. For 400 years, the Romans and Celts would struggle for supremacy in Europe, a conflict that, in the end, would define them both but while Rome would celebrate its victories in monumental architecture, the Celts would gradually fade from history. 
One big difference between the Celts and the Romans is that the Celts left us no written records of their own. Theirs was an oral tradition, not a written one. Unlike the Romans, who documented almost every detail of their lives in their writings, in their sculptures, and in their monuments. But the Celts aren't entirely invisible to us. The world that they left behind is there to be discovered beneath our feet. Throughout Europe, archaeologists are unearthing the world of the ancient Celts. I'm in central France in Champagne country, and here on the outskirts of Boucher in April 2013, a team of archaeologists found something very exciting indeed. They were investigating this area simply because this is going to be the site of a large new warehouse. And what they stumbled across was a burial site. They discovered the graves of 27 men and women, and they'd been buried here in the fourth century BC. This was an Iron Age cemetery. The people buried here were Celts. Finds like Boucher give us direct insight into who the Celts really were. This is one of the skeletons from those graves at Boucher. And in fact, this is one of the most complete skeletons that were found because some of the bones are in a very bad state of repair indeed. Now I've looked really carefully at these bones and I can't see any signs of injury or disease on them. But in fact, there are some marks or perhaps I should say stains just here on the left forearm bones. Now, this isn't a disease. This is where something made of copper or copper alloy has lain very close to these bones in the grave. And in fact, with all these skeletons, with all these graves at Boucher, it's not the human remains themselves that are the most interesting. It's what was buried with them. The bodies were accompanied into the afterlife by their possessions, and they reveal a surprisingly sophisticated culture. We've got some fibulae, some brooches here, uh, some bracelets, some little pins just there, and a couple of necklaces as well. The, the fibulae are gorgeous. This fibula is the pièce de résistance. It has a repeating pattern running along the body of interwoven spirals. And then this strange white button just here is actually made of coral. So that would have come from the Mediterranean. This is a fairly classic Celtic talk. The thing which characterises them is this opening at the bottom with these two terminals. And the whole neck ring would have been twisted open in order to place it around somebody's neck. And it's got this nice decoration stamped onto the shaft. A few of the graves contained weaponry. And these swords are absolutely beautiful. They are still in their scabbards and the degradation of the iron has meant that it's sprung apart. So you can actually probably see the sword sitting inside there. Now the length of these swords is interesting. They're not quite as long as the, as the slashing swords that would have been carried by the cavalrymen amongst the Celts. So these are designed to be carried by warriors on foot. And here this iron band is decorated. We've got these strange circles just here, but if you look at them really carefully, you realise what they are. These circles, which are made of coral, are the eyes of two dragons. So we've got this lovely symmetrical pattern on this scabbard, which is actually very different from this one. Both these styles are typical of the period, but they're very individual at the same time. And you can imagine that these swords would have been very prized personal items. The picture emerging is that the Celts were a people with individual style and technical skill who took pride in their appearance and weaponry. It's a far cry from the naked savage 
depicted by Rome. Over two and a half thousand years ago, the Celts and Romans were destined to meet as Celtic influence spread south of the Alps into northern Italy. And we know that some Celts must have come through here, the Alpine Pass of Valcamonica. Carved, etched into the rocks hereabouts are markings that some archaeologists believe could be the very earliest depictions of Celts. As they came through these high alpine passes, they encountered a mountain people called the Camuni. And it may well be the case that it was those Camuni who made these marks in the rocks and so created the very first indelible record of what the Celts looked like and what they had. And what you've got on here is something really quite remarkable. Most obvious, perhaps, is a depiction of a four-wheeled vehicle, a chariot. Elsewhere, there's a couple of warriors, or at least figures who seem to be armed with spears and shields. But it's a fabulous, unforgettable snapshot of what someone saw when a new people arrived. What is clear is that the Celts who ventured south were ready to fight. This whole area is just peppered, littered with the rock carvings, so that you've even got to look underneath the leaf mould in case you're missing something. You clear it away. And look there, right away. That's fantastic. You see that figure there, look? A man, his head, two legs, he's got shoes on, and he's holding a spear. And then in his left, well, that's either a small kind of buckler-type shield or it could be a trophy, it could be a man's severed head, who knows? And so it goes on. Just got to keep revealing the canvas. There's more. There's a crowd of them there, armed with spears and shields and swords. More of them. They're fantastic. Everything about it seems to be either warlike and aggressive or jubilant. You know, the figures are either threatening combat or they're celebrating victory, but they're very much alive. Whoever saw them and decided to commit their image to the rock had been impressed and wanted to make sure that some aspect of their arrival was remembered. The Celtic tribes were migrating, taking new lands and moving south towards central Italy. The ordered, structured world of Rome had a storm coming. To find out what happened when the Romans first met the Celts, we have to rely on this, Livy's History of Rome. Now, bear in mind that Livy, Titus Livius, was a Roman, so he's likely to be partisan, and he was writing 300 years after the event. He tells us that that first meeting between the Romans and the Celts took place in 387 BC in Clusium, a town in what's now Tuscany, a hundred miles north of Rome. It's hard to believe, strolling around this peaceful Tuscan hill town today, but events that unfolded here would set in train centuries of conflict and bloodshed. Libby writes that outlandish warriors in their thousands, armed with strange weapons, marched to Clusium in search of new lands to conquer and riches to plunder. They were led by a Celtic tribal leader and warlord called Brennus. While the Celtic horde descended upon Clusium, 
The town's officials sent word to Rome asking for armed protection. But the request was denied. Instead, Rome sent three of her ambassadors to negotiate a peaceful settlement. It would be the first time Rome would come face to face with her greatest adversary, and so begin centuries of struggle for the heart and soul of Europe. As negotiations started, the Celts demanded land, and with vastly superior numbers, they were in no mood for compromise. There was a fierce argument, and in the heat of the moment, a Roman ambassador stabbed his spear through a Celtic chieftain's heart, killing him instantly. In a single stroke, the oath of neutrality, one of Rome's own accepted customs, was broken. The Celts demanded that the Roman in question be handed over to them for suitable punishment. The demand was ignored. Big mistake. Livy wrote, the Celts flamed into uncontrollable anger and set forward with terrible speed, covering miles of ground. The cry went up, to Rome. The Romans came face to face with the Celts in 387 BC, but from modern archaeology, we know that Celtic culture goes back much further than that. Some of the earliest evidence comes from a tiny village southeast of Salzburg in Austria called Hallstatt. It's a place that has given its name to an entire Celtic period and has become synonymous with early Celtic culture. This is Hallstatt, tucked away in a fold of the Austrian Alps. It's a quiet town with an even quieter population, and yet it's one of the most famous names in archaeology and the ideal starting point for any investigation of the Celts, because it's here that we catch the very first glimpses of Celtic material culture by which I mean identifiable things left behind by Celts. Hallstatt culture. I had it drummed into my head when I was an archaeology student. And now, 30 years after I first heard the term, I'm finally here. Starting in 1846, archaeologists at Hallstatt gradually unearthed over a 1,000 graves out of perhaps 5,000 scattered across the upper valley, an entire city of the dead. Within the graves were over 20,000 artefacts dating back as far as 800 BC. Intricate brooches, gold bracelets, vessels made of sheet bronze, iron daggers and axes. This was the earliest evidence of a long-forgotten prehistoric culture, a culture we now recognise as Celtic. Archaeologist Hans Reschreiter has worked here for over 25 years. What was special about the graves that were found here? And so the number of the graves, we have more than 5,000 of them, and also the, the grave goods we found within the graves. We have a lot of jewellery and other lux luxury products in the graves. Here in Hallstatt, more than 60% of the graves are with a lot of grave goods. Ah, right, so the majority of people who died and were buried in these graves yes. were rich enough to take stuff with them. Yes, that's it. How do you know this wasn't a graveyard for the wealthy? How do you know the poor weren't buried somewhere else? 
No, uh, the traces on the skeletons, the muscle marks show that also the people in the rich graves have worked their whole life long. And with this, this muscle marks show traces of heavy workload. So what kind of activity creates that kind of build-up of, of wear and tear on the bones? For the women, for example, we see that they have a heavy workload on one shoulder. It seems they have carried heavy loads on one shoulder. Right. And for the men, uh, we have no muscles on the, on the legs, right. but uh, we have a lot of muscles here on the shoulders. Right, so whatever it was they were doing required upper body strength, yes. but not a lot of moving around. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Right. What made Hallstatt unique can still be found buried deep inside these mountains. A valuable commodity that made the ancient people who lived here rich and Hallstatt famous. Right, we have the first prehistoric site. We are entering here. Take care, it's slippery. Uh -huh. <laughs> right, now this tunnel is a little bit different than the one we walked up. Oh yeah, it is. Here we see the remains of one of these huge uh, prehistoric tunnels. So, so you've re-excavated a space that was originally made 3,000 years ago. Wow. And the, the shining's a crystalline sand. That's the salt. That's the salt, yes. That's poor rock salt. Uh, this is the salt the prehistoric miners were looking for. And this salt is heading in this direction, so the prehistoric miners followed uh, the direction of the salt. Salt was highly prized as a vital preservative in the ancient world and the Celts of Hallstatt mined it on a massive scale. This mountain is riddled with huge excavated galleries, up to 200 metres long and 20 metres high. Everything the miners left behind is preserved perfectly. Here you see thousands of burnt down tapers to illuminate the light. Oh, the tapers from the end of, of flaming yes. torches? Yes. And this is, this is everything that, that the wealth of Hallstatt society, Hallstatt yeah. culture was all built on, it's this. So that explains the marks on the skeletons in the graves. It's the labour in here. Oh yes, it is. Uh, the, the tool handles we find in here, those are the handles of the bronze picks uh, to break these huge plates of salt. And the, the, the work with those picks explains the, the uh, marks on the um, male skeletons and we think that the marks on the female skeletons are from the carrying these huge plates of salt. So they bear the marks of a lifetime of labor oh, on yes. the skeletons. Yes. So for the Hallstatt people it was this was their life, this was their surrounding, it was quite normal. They were subterranean. Yeah, oh yeah. Within this ancient mine are also very personal reminders of the people that worked here. So am I right in thinking that that there is proof of a life? Oh yeah, this is a prehistoric excrement. I'll, I'll be honest with you, Hans, I never expected to catch this intimate a glimpse of a Celtic salt miner. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel a strange sense of communion and brotherhood. <laughs> oh yeah. And in this excrement we also find uh, the eggs of uh, parasites. So uh, we have to prove that nearly all the miners had parasites in their stomach. So it, uh, it was not a nice time uh, more than a few thousand years ago. And if it gets wet, it still smells. Oh no, that is oh, yeah. unbelievable. The Iron Age is alive and well down here. It's preserved because of the salt in here. It's my first salted poo. <laughs> The salt from this mountain was of such high quality it became a prized commodity traded throughout the region. The people of Hallstatt grew rich from this white gold at a time when another commodity was starting to transform prehistoric society, iron. The secrets of iron production had spread from Asia Minor through the Eastern Mediterranean into Central Europe. People had long been able to extract copper and tin to make bronze. 
Iron ore was more plentiful, but iron was harder to extract and to work. Repeated heating and hammering yielded a metal hardened, durable, and perfect for weaponry. The Celts became masters at it. The extraordinary finds at Hallstatt revealed the Celts as wealthy, industrious, and technologically sophisticated. It was the birth of a new and very distinctive culture, one that would grow, influence, and ultimately dominate Europe. Hallstatt would become famous as the birthplace of a new culture that thrived and spread across great swathes of Europe. By 500 BC, the Celts had arrived in northern Italy. And by 387 BC, having been wronged by Roman ambassadors at Clusium, the Celtic chieftain Brennus and his men were marching south to Rome, hungry for revenge. The Roman army, having received word of the approaching Celtic horde, marched north to meet them, led by General Quintus Sulpicius. Sulpicius had six legions under his command, approximately 24,000 soldiers. Just 11 miles from Rome, he encountered his enemy on a plain next to the River Allia. This is by no means the most atmospheric place. Right behind me, there's a high-speed rail track. The whole area is crisscrossed with overhead power lines. But we believe that thousands of people died here. This is the battlefield of Allia, where the Roman army came face to face with the Celts for the very first time in pitched battle. And it's worth remembering too that the Roman commander, Sulpicius, had next to no knowledge of his foe. He knew nothing about their tactics or their weaponry. And furthermore, he'd been caught on the hop with hardly any time to prepare for what he could now see was ahead of him and coming his way. Mike Lodes, an expert in ancient military tactics, has been piecing together what happened on the battlefield nearly two and a half thousand years ago. Hey, Neil. How are you? Good to see you. You I'm too, good. you too. It doesn't really have the feel of a battlefield. No, well, it's not the prettiest, is it? It's but it, not. It, it's a reminder that history happens under our feet, where we live our everyday lives. I kind of like the ordinariness of it. What about the topography would have appealed to a commander? Well, you've got to remember that this is not the Roman army of later years. We're talking 387 BC. This is a fledgling Rome. It's a small force, and they're fighting in a phalanx. That's 10, 15 rows deep, shoulder to shoulder. Mm -hmm. You've got that rigid, static, entrenched Roman attitude to fighting. You hold your ground. You take your position. What I think Sulpicius was trying to do was force a pitched battle on this plane. That's where he set his phalanx, expecting that Brennus would bring his hordes on to engage them. And on that hill, which probably didn't have all those trees on back then, Sulpicius would have put his cavalry, the equites, the elite Roman soldiers. And I think Sulpicius was planning to either sweep down on a flanking maneuver or come round behind the Celts. So what did go wrong for Sulpicius and his Romans? Well, the first thing is, Brennius didn't do what Sulpicius thought he was supposed to do. He didn't play the game. He didn't let his undisciplined hordes rush forward. He had control of them. And they went streaming up that hill, and they drove that elite Roman cavalry off the battlefield. The Celts were much more imaginative, swirling and using the landscape, and it was hit and run and fluid. It's just a different way of commanding the battlefield. It sounds as if the analogy is that the Celt is the flowing stream and the Roman is the rock in the river. With the elite cavalry dealt with, the Celtic warriors turned their attention to the Roman phalanxes on the plain.
Overrun and outmaneuvered, the Roman legionaries fled in panic, terrified by the Celtic charge. Many were cut down in the rout, others drowned in the alia weighed down by their heavy bronze armour. The Romans would later claim they lost 20,000 men that day. The city of Rome was left to its fate. The Romans may have thought their enemy had come out of nowhere, but the Celts had had connections with the Mediterranean world for years. Hill forts are iconic features of Celtic Europe. Iron Age castles that were the homes of chiefs and great centers of power. Hoyneberg, built in the 6th century BC, lies nearly 250 miles west of Hallstatt in southern Germany. This is Hoyneberg. And in 600 BC, this whole place would have been covered in Iron Age buildings. And archaeologists are arguing that we shouldn't just view this as a hill fort, but that this was a city, perhaps the first city north of the Alps. The Celtic city of Heuneberg is estimated to have had a population of 5,000 and its construction was on a grand scale. A five metre high white wall surrounded the entire citadel, punctuated by huge defensive towers, which were further protected by a large earthen ditch six metres deep. This was architecture designed to be impregnable and to impress. Dirk Krause is the head of archaeology at Heuneberg. These walls, these are pretty magnificent, aren't they? They're much more magnificent than, than I expected, I think, for an Iron Age fort. Yeah, because they are unique and they are very extraordinary. Normally they built uh, with timber and stone and earth, but here they used limestone foundation and above they built with uh, mud bricks. And this um, painting is uh, necessary for the protection of the mud bricks because we have bad weather here north of the Alps. It's also for demonstration of power because these walls were seen from miles away. Uh, so everyone who came here knew this is a mighty site. Oh, so this is what the walls are like underneath all that white paint? Yeah, these are the mud bricks. They're not baked uh, clay bricks, but they are dried in the sun or at the air. So just how unusual is this style of building for the Iron Age? It's extraordinary. They, they didn't build with mud bricks north of the Alps, never, never before and never afterwards. Where has this idea come from? Now, for a long time, it was a mystery where this idea came from. Uh, but the combination of mud bricks and of towers, which were built in the citadel wall here, you find it only in the Phoenician culture, in, for example, in the Levante or in Sicily or in the um, Iberian Peninsula. So maybe an architect came here who learned to build in a Phoenician context. It's, a, it's an example of this Mediterranean influence, I think, centuries before you think Mediterranean influence really takes off with the, with the Roman Empire. Yeah. When you get up on the top of the Hoyneberg, you realise just why it was such an important site. It dominates the landscape, but it's also extremely well connected within this landscape. That down there is the Danube, which of course carries on and flows east to the Black Sea. And to the south of the Hoyneberg, the Rhine rises. These are really important river routes, but there are also important overland routes nearby as well. The autobahns of the Iron Age. Silver from Iberia, amber from the Baltic, wine and pottery from Italy and Greece crisscrossed the continent, east to west, south to north. 
Its links to the wider world made Hoyneburg a vital hub for trade and industry and helped to build the foundations of a powerful civilization. The enormous wealth from this trade transformed early Celtic leaders into more than chiefs. It created an elite class, the oligarchs of the Iron Age. Some can even be regarded as royalty. This burial mound protected the grave of a man who died around 530 BC. He's become known as the Hochdorf Prince because dispatched with him into the afterlife were some of the most remarkable finds of the early Celtic world, now housed in the depository of the Stuttgart Museum. This is fantastic, just look at this. This is the couch that the Hochdorf Prince was laid to rest on in his tomb. And it's made entirely out of sheet bronze, riveted together. We've got this wonderful hammered pattern, stylized warriors fighting in single combat. And then at each end, we've got the representation of a four wheeled chariot pulled by two stallions with a warrior holding a shield and a spear. I suppose you've got to remember that when it was put in the grave, it would have been a beautiful, shiny bronze object and not this green, verdigreed appearance that we, that we see now. And you can see that this bronze couch is at the moment resting on these steel legs, which of course are not original. This is what it originally stood on. So this is one of the eight legs of this couch, and you can see that it's a little bronze figurine. So this is a woman bearing a pot on her head and she's drilled all over and would have been inlaid with coral. And she's standing astride a wheel. So she's a miniature unicyclist. So this couch would have been on casters. Also discovered in the tomb were drinking horns, bronze plates and a vast cauldron decorated with three lions that would have contained up to 500 litres of honey mead. This is the cauldron. It is enormous. The size of it is incredibly impressive. And cauldrons really are emblematic of something which was pretty fundamental in Celtic society, and that, of course, was feasting. This was the way that chieftains showed their power and their wealth and kept their allies close to them. Just based on the size of his cauldron, the Hochdorf prince must have been a fairly important person. But the greatest luxuries of all were found on the prince himself. Our Hochdorf prince was wrapped in layers and layers of cloth. And not only that, he was adorned with all of this gold. And it is stunning. He was wearing this beautiful golden neck ring. When you look at it really, really closely, you realise that what appears at first glance to be an abstract pattern is in fact a little repeating stamp of a tiny rider on a horse. And then there are these two golden fibulae or brooches and you can see that the pins have been deliberately bent. So this is part of the strange ritual of his funeral. He was buried with these brooches but they're not to be used again by a living person. And then other objects like a bronze dagger, which has been encased in gold, again, with a hammered pattern all over it. But I think what is most extraordinary about this entire collection are his shoes. Now, of course, I say shoes, but the shoes themselves had long since rotted away. But what we have left are these wonderful gold plaques going around the top of the shoe here and right up and over the toe. So having lived in luxury. He took luxury to the grave with him. And he also took everything he needed to carry on feasting right into the afterlife. From the tiny Alpine village of Hallstatt had grown one of Europe's great ancient cultures. The Celts may not have fitted the classical model, but they were a rich, 
complex and structured society. A telling contrast to the Roman image of a naked warrior, the wild barbarian of the dying Gaul. I learnt the accepted theory as an archaeology student, but brand new research is suggesting that Celtic origins might be far more complex and intriguing. If we're trying to track down the Celts and find out how and where it all started, there are a number of lines of evidence that we can follow. There's archaeology, so we can look for their material culture, their swords and shields and jewellery, and look at how that spreads across Europe. But we can also look at language, because we believe that these Iron Age tribes spoke very similar languages, and that we have surviving Celtic languages in the west of Europe, in Wales, in Scotland, Ireland, Cornwall and Brittany. But it's not to any of those places that I've come in search of ancient Celtic language. It is to the Algarve, to southwest Portugal. John Cook is a philologist, the study of literary text, and he's behind a new theory of Celtic origins that starts with a very old source, the ancient Greek historian Herodotus. John, I must say that I didn't expect to come to Portugal in search of the Celts, but you think that they were here. Oh, I have no doubt that the Celts were here. Um, as well as saying that the Celts lived near the source of the Danube. Uh, Herodotus, in our first good references to the Celts, writing in the 5th century BC, says that they also lived uh, beyond the Pillars of Hercules, that's the Straits of Gibraltar, and next to a people he calls the Cunetes. And the Cunetes seems to be a Celtic name as well. So we have Celts in name and Celts linguistically. So how do we square that? what Herodotus is telling us with this idea that the Celts come from Central Europe, that is their homeland, and then they spread out, and that Western Europe is very much a, a kind of afterthought. Well, I think we need to look at that uh, differently. We need to re-examine that whole idea. It simply doesn't work. For John, what doesn't work is the absence of archaeological evidence linking the Celts here to the Celts of Central Europe. But there is evidence linking the Iberian Celts to Britain, Ireland and the Atlantic coastline. The clues are etched into ancient stone tablets that date to the 7th century BC, the same period as the Hallstatt Celts. So, John, what have we got here? What is this stone? Is it a gravestone? Well, this, is, this was found uh, in the far southwest of the peninsula, a place called Fonteberia, which was a necropolis, a burial ground of the uh, early Iron Age. And can you read it, John? This bit, logo ball, the first word, looks very much like uh, dedications that we have in northwestern Spain of Lugu ball. And these are dedications to the Celtic god Lug. Nira ball probably means something like to the chief men. Uh, so we have to the gods Lug and to the chief men is the opening of this inscription. Logon, I think up here, I think this might be the word for burial because we get a very similar word in Northern Italy in a Celtic inscription about probably about 500 years later. So this looks like a Celtic word written in stone? It looks like a Celtic, I mean, it's a Celtic name and it looks like it has a Celtic inflected ending on it. So it's grammatically Celtic and it's etymologically Celtic. And it still has links to extant Celtic languages, to Celtic languages spoken by living people. Oh yeah, that's how we know. I mean, that's sort of the, by definition, mm. this, is, this is how uh, we decide something is Celtic. John thinks that this is an ancient language written down using the alphabet of the Phoenicians, Mediterranean seafarers who reached the Iberian Peninsula as long ago as 900 BC. But although this language has been written using that alphabet, it's not Phoenician. It's Celtic. 
This early Celtic has clear links to later Celtic languages spoken in Britain and Ireland, such as Gaelic, Welsh and Cornish. And John believes that Bronze Age traders and seafarers used this proto-Celtic as they traded silver, copper and tin up and down the Atlantic coastline, from Portugal to northern Spain, Brittany to Ireland and the West Country. And for me, this is really exciting because this is new. This idea is turning what we think about the Celts totally on its head. Instead of thinking about a migration out of Central Europe, we've got something really interesting happening on this Atlantic fringe, something that could actually be the origin of the Celts. This new theory suggests that rather than being invaded by Iron Age Celts, our Celtic heritage arrived in Britain during the Bronze Age, using a very different mechanism. So, my Celticness might have much more to do with the exchange of ores and ingots than with the blood and gore of a raiding party. And if that's true, then Britain and the far west of Europe may have had much more influence on the spread of Celtic culture in Central Europe than was previously imagined. And there's a fascinating piece of evidence to support all of that. This is a Gundlingen sword, an early Celtic sword. It has this elegant leaf shape, and it sweeps back into a big, broad pommel. It's typically Celtic. Now, a generation ago, swords like this were cited as evidence of the spread of the Celts into the West from Central Europe. So you'd find them made of iron all over Central Germany and France. But recently, archeologists have been finding lots of swords like this in Britain made of bronze, just like this one. They're from the early 8th century. They're before Hallstatt. It suggests that it may have been swords made in Britain from bronze that influenced the weapons technology of the early Iron Age, spreading from west to east, from Britain to Central Europe, and not the other way around. So when it comes to the case of a Celtic warlord like Brennus and his men, they may have been carrying weapons that were shaped by a technology that had its foundations in Britain. In 387 BC, for the first time, the Celtic and Roman worlds had clashed at the Battle of Allia. According to the Roman historian Livy, 20,000 legionaries had lost their lives that day, leaving the city of Rome at the mercy of the Celtic army under the command of Chief Brennus. Livy wrote the following. As there was no hope of defending the city, the decision was taken to withdraw all men capable of bearing arms, together with the women and children and able-bodied senators, into the fortress on the capital. From that stronghold, properly armed and provisioned, it was their intention to make a last stand for themselves, for their gods, and for the Roman name. The fortress was up there on the Capitoline Hill, one of the seven hills upon which Rome was built. The city, which had never been defeated, was about to face the fury of its greatest foe. Livy wrote, then news came that the Gauls were at the gates and all too soon, cries like the howling of wolves and barbaric songs could be heard. That howling of wolves and barbaric din might have come from a carnix, a Celtic war trumpet. The Celts carried hundreds of them into battle. Today, however, there is only one carnix player in the world Musician, John Kenny. <laughs> 
The carnyx clearly was used to strike fear into enemies in battles. The sound is made in the same way that we activate a modern trumpet, trombone, French horn tuba. You vibrate your lips. <laughs> But with this instrument, the sound is entrapped in a bronze skull. And the skull works exactly like our skull, because our vocal cords are amplified by all of the nasal passages and the shape, form of our skull. That's why we can make a sound without opening our mouths. Mm, ah, mm. It's exactly the same with this instrument. So the sound isn't projected forward, it's radial, and that's extremely uh, unusual in the world of musical instruments. The sound of these trumpets, accompanied by howls and shouts, is thought to have been a deliberate part of the Celtic battle plan, designed to terrify the enemy. The world at that time was a much quieter place. These instruments can outshout human beings and play as loud as thunder and loud as the sea. Furthermore, when they're played upright, they're 12 feet high and they have a head. So if you see 12 or so of these coming out of the mist in the morning, screaming like mad, it's quite possible to imagine you're being attacked by a race of giants. <laughs> By the time the Celts entered the city of Rome, its citizens had either retreated to the Capitoline Hill or fled. The streets were empty. Livy tells us that the Celts came across a mansion belonging to Roman nobility and found the doors open. Suspecting a trap, they entered cautiously. But the only thing waiting for them was a group of elderly Romans sitting motionless in an act of silent defiance. The Celtic warriors stood entranced by the spectacle. On an impulse, a Celtic warrior reached out with his hand and touched the beard of one of the seated figures. The Roman lashed out and hit him over the head with his ivory staff. It was the moment that sealed the city's fate. Celtic warriors butchered the old men where they sat and looted and burned the imperial city to the ground. Eventually, faced with the prospect of starvation or slaughter, the Romans trapped on the Capitoline Hill had no choice but to surrender, agreeing to pay the Celts a ransom in gold. The commander, Quintus Sulpicius, who had led the army to defeat at the Battle of Alia, agreed to negotiate a settlement with the Celtic warlord, Brennus. They agreed the sum of 1,000 pounds in weight in gold, a colossal ransom for a city already ravaged.
Just to add insult to injury, Brennus used weights that were heavier than normal to weigh the gold. It was the second time he had outwitted Sulpicius. <laughs> When the Roman commander objected, Brennus flung his sword onto the scales, shouting, Vi Victus, woe to the vanquished. Vi Victus. It was a dramatic reminder that the Romans were totally at the mercy of the Celts. The Romans had learned the hard way that the Celts were far from the wild savages portrayed. During the course of four centuries, they had developed a complex and powerful tribal network. Theirs was a warrior culture with a shared language and extensive trading links. They had expanded across Central Europe, through the Alps and south into Italy, where they had defeated the emergent Roman Empire. In the years that followed, Rome was rebuilt and defended by a new impregnable barrier, the Servian Wall. It was a permanent reminder to its citizens of their defeat at the hands of the Celts. They were resolved never to let their city fall again. For Rome, it was a new beginning. And over the next few hundred years, the Romans would collide again with the Celts and battle for survival for land, for the very heart and soul of Europe. Next time, 300 years later, we discover the golden age of the Celts and their expansion to the furthest reaches of Europe and beyond. In France, Rome's greatest military general, Julius Caesar, is challenged by a warrior king commanding an army of a quarter of a million men. At stake, is the survival of the Celtic heartland of Gaul.